Now, before I go into mentorship, I have tried to relate what I call the scoreboard or the dashboard, or put it simply, the benchmark for measuring through success. You see, come to look at it. Somebody will say he's very successful because he has a big industry, because he has attained a great position, because he has a chain of decrees, because he has a home, because he's wealthy. But as I look through the Bible, and as I look through the lives of men, I found that there are certain measurable indices. And these are going to form the background as we begin to look at mentorship. That every man will use to calibrate and ask himself, am I a successful person? And this church I've tried to define that success is what brings you satisfaction. But significance is what moves the world forward. A man may be successful, but he may not really be significant. Christians don't aim for success, they aim for significance. And I said the very first thing you need to know in achieving these end points is that you must ask yourself, what is the source? Where is the source? Anything you want to do in this life, we must find the source. And we all know that as Christians, the source of everything is Jesus Christ. But then there are intermediary sources for things. If you are a student, you find yourself, you have qualified. Ask yourself, where is the source? It, may start, it started maybe from your first day your, your dad gave you and sent you to school. If you have just defended your PhD, you ask, what is the source? It may have started from the very first day your supervisor gave you a topic. When men forget their source, and when men forget their root, they tend to be proud and they enter into a shipwreck. And so wherever you are, no matter what you have attained, you can never kick your source and expect to be successful. The second thing I say is that you must recognize the power of the seed. Somebody was asking me, what is the greatest lesson I have ever learned this year? I tell them that one of the greatest lessons I have learned is that the seed has great potential. What is the seed? The seed is your life. The seed is what you give. The seed is your money. What Arobos was asked, what is the greatest lesson he has ever learned in life? Throughout his life of 92 years. He said, the greatest lesson I've ever learned is the power of the seed. And when he sets the seed out, the next thing he does is to think about the harvest. Life is a seed. And as Paul put it this way, whosoever sows sparingly shall reap sparingly. And as Jesus Christ put it, he said, cast, uh, he said, he says, he said, give and it shall be given unto you. Measures, pressed down, shaking together, running over, shall men give your bosom. And as Solomon put it this way, he said, there's one that will hold it more than he should do. And it tends to penury. penury. And they see that give it out and he has abundance. And he says, the liberal soul shall be made fat. And he cancels all. He says, cast your bread upon the waters, for you shall find it after many days. The seed is not just our, our treasures. It is our talent. It is also our gifts. Everything that God has given us, our life is a seed. When we sow them, it multiplies. Jesus put it this way. He said, whosoever shall gain his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life for my name's sake, the same shall gain it. Seed is sacrificial. You sacrifice something you desire in order to get something that you, must, you cannot afford to lose. And he says, except the call of wheat dies, it abides alone. So who, those who do not sow seeds remain alone, idolized alone, but they don't go forward. Then, which I mentioned this is very common to management experts, your unique selling potential. In management, they call it your unique selling potential. But I call it your unique serving potential. What I call it, your, this, your strength zone. Your strength zone. One of the greatest authors in management said that people do not rise up by trying to change their weaknesses to strength. People rise up by capitalizing on their strength and minimizing on their weakness. One man said it is better to take people who have the strength and you train them to be super strength than to take somebody who is a mediocre 
and will take him to a point when he can have strength. God gives us strength based on our personalities, based on the gifts in us, and every individual must find his unique serving potential. Again, we must also, we must also know how we synchronize our life with our lifestyle. The word lifestyle means your life and your style. If you say you believe in certain things, then your style should focus on it. If you say you believe in holiness, then your lifestyle should be in holiness. When our life does not synchronize with our style, when there is a divergent living between what we live and what we, what we, what we say we are and what we are, then that tends to be playing an actor's game. And to anyone to measure his success, he must measure it. Then we must know the principles of sustainability. Every now and then we must ask ourselves, what is sustainable? What can stand the test of time? What can outlive my life? Life is not in its duration. It is in its donation. What can I do that will be sustained? And anybody who wants to do anything great must ask himself how sustainable it is. Several years ago, we were trying to build this church. Many people gave us different reasons, different kind of churches we shall build. But there was only one word that came to me in my secret, service, in my secret mind. Now, whenever a person builds a church, he doesn't build it for himself or his generation. He builds a church beyond his generation. He builds a church for his children and great-grandchildren. He builds a church for those yet to come. And so if the technology of today is utilized to build the church of today, that technology will disappear with time. Build your church with technology of tomorrow, the technology of the future. So no matter what happens, it will stand the test of time. That is what it means to have sustainability. Many people just say, well, all in my lifetime, all for the now, all for what I can do best. But greatness is thinking about how sustainable it is. How sustainable is the sermon you preach? How sustainable is the giving you give? What significance is your giving to the situation? What significance is your life to it? Think of the sustainability. Then we must maximize the secret place. No one can truly be great who never understands the principle of the secret place. The secret place is where lives are, are molded. It's where characters are built. It's where human beings interact and consult with their maker. It is our private life that determines our public, public greatness. It is where we are nurtured and kept. It is where we are defended and protected. It is where God builds boundaries around us and nobody attacks us. Knowing the secret place is the secret behind invincibility. It is the secret behind longevity. It is the secret behind indestructibility. It is the secret behind the enemy not being able to know your secret. But if you don't have a secret place, if you don't know where you can stay in the presence of God, if everything about you is social, if everything about you is public glare, if everything about you is announced by people, then you miss it. One great woman of God was saying one time she was in the secret place, consulting God. Then the children said, Mommy, we have to eat. You are spending too long a time there, we have to eat. And the woman shouted, My dear children, the more I spend in this secret place, the more of a mother I can be. But the less I spend in the secret place, you will not like the kind of creature you will see if I don't go to the secret place. She knew that the secret place was the place characters are molded. He knew that the secret place is the place men are made. There is no respect for any minister whose credibility for ministry is in the pulpit. There's no respect for any minister whose credibility for ministry is in evangelism, in the outward. There's no credibility for any minister whose credibility for ministry is what people say. It is one thing to be respected by men, but it's much more important to be respected by God. Again, we cannot succeed except we know the stumbling blocks on the way. What I call is seduction power. Even of us, and that's one thing about mentorship. Mentorship makes us to recognize that greatness is one thing, but to stay sustained in greatness, you must understand that such as, as there are stepping stones to greatness, so there are stumbling blocks to notoriety. And you must understand the stumbling blocks in the way. Look at them. As I said in church last Sunday, the only panacea against temptation is to run from temptation. The closer you are to temptation, the more exciting it is, the more enjoyable it is, 
the more it seems as if you cannot do without it. But the longer you get out of temptation zone, the power of temptation loses its grip. And so if you are going to be anything in this life, we must understand the power of the stumbling block. Again, I talked about the power of the staying power. I only tell you that when you fall, it's not, it's, not, it's not really important. It's not worrisome to fall. We are human and we fall. But when you fall, fall forward. And no matter how much you are knocked down by the world, it doesn't matter, but don't get knocked out. One of the greatest um, boxers in the world said, I don't care how many times I'm knocked down in the canvas, but I will stay on, never to be knocked out. And that's the power, that's the staying power. That is to stick to itiveness. That is the power that allows you never to quit. And if you are going to succeed in any pursuit that God has given you, in the nurturing of a child, in the bringing up of a family, in trusting God for a miracle, in passing the exams, whatever things you are going to do in life, you must learn to say to yourself, haven't de determined and haven't decided, nothing will make you to turn your back. Then I said again the power of seasons. You see, seasons are things that don't come every now and then. They come at different moments. It is only wise people that understand that this is another season. There is a season you are required to do certain things. There was a time in this church when we were building a church. And I knew in my mind's eye that that was the season of giving. I said in this church that was the day I emptied my bank account. I took a loan and I gave everything to the church. I knew that was the time of season of giving. When the season of giving came, it wasn't the time for me to tell someone that I have another project. And those of you know that I had a building project that I had to abandon. But I knew that was the season of giving. But let me tell you, immediately I stopped, that season of giving came, left. The season of receiving come. You see, when you miss out on a season, you don't get it right. When you rationalize a season, when you give reasons for not doing a season, Recently, somebody asked me for money. Somebody had been giving money on several locations. I was very hesitant to reply. And I wanted to reply to the person. I tell the person, you know I have a lot of projects. You know I have a lot of things in church. The Lord said, Why, when a person asks you for money, what is the use telling the person you have, want to buy a new car when the person hasn't got a car? When the person asks you for money, what is the need telling them you want to travel abroad when the person doesn't even know how a plane looks like? When a person asks you for money, what's the point telling him that you want to buy a new shoe when a person has always been working on slippers? He says, my dear son, give what you will give and forget about your pri private problems. And then I called the person, I said, the Lord has told me to forget about my private problems and I can give you what you can give. Because I knew that was the season of giving. That was the season of giving. Because during those seasons, what you say matters than what you do. Because after the season had gone, people will quote and requote what you said and what you do. Find out the season you are and synchronize with that season. When you are in this season, you don't give any excuse. Excuse is the, is the, what I call it, is the, is the closest friend of failure. And those who want to fail are good at giving excuses. Don't give excuses. What must be done must be done. Excuses have no place. Again, we must understand the amazing power of a mission statement. A mission or purpose statement. Every individual who has been created by God must have a mission statement. A mission statement is a declaration of, is a definition of where you are going. It's your pathway, it's your direction, it's the most of your life. It is the uncompromisable of your, of your life. My mission is to do this. Jesus had it, knew his mission. He said, I must do the will of him that have sent me and I must finish his task. He had a magnificent obsession. That was his mission. One man was sent to a place where there were no Christians. He said his mission is to be that at the end of my stay here, there will be no unbeliever. And he achieved his mission. Bata said, my mission is to shoot the world. And now, before he died, he was able to establish shoe all over the world. Bill Gates said, my mission is that every living human being must at least use the Microsoft software in his computer. And he achieved it. The founder of Coca-Cola said, my mission is to make sure that every single individual tastes the Coca-Cola at least once. That was his mission. That was his driving force. When Paul was asked and was told, look, there's going to be trouble for you in Jerusalem. They're going to be kill you. You know, 
and somebody was pandering with prophecy, telling him, look, don't go there. And they were weeping. And, and, and he wondered, and he said, what are you talking about? It is for this reason that I was made. And I'm ready to live and to die for my mission. The Bible said that before Jesus Christ was crucified, he faced Jerusalem steadfastly. Let me tell you, if you don't, before you can say things work according to plan, you must have a plan that is workable. Somebody was telling me the thing doesn't work out. That everything has not worked according to plan. I said, what is your plan? When you don't plan to succeed, naturally you plan to fail. Nature abhors a vacuum. So what is your mission statement? You say you have an organization. What is your mission statement? What is the mission statement of your family? What is the mission statement of your church? Do everybody believe in this mission statement? I was addressing the students, of, the students and staff of Benson, the outside university on Monday. And I asked them, what is the Idahosa's way? Everybody has his own way. What is Idahosa's way? What is your, your university's way? When anybody comes to your university, what will they say is your way? The power. 